most of you know already Federico. Well, Federico Vázquez is a recycler conifer, which is the equivalent of CSIC in, in Argentina. Uh, he's working in La Plata and in, 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 in the Instituto de Física de Líquidos y Sistemas Biológicos. Well, Federico did his studies in, in physics in, in Mar del Plata. Uh, and then he moved to Boston University to, to work with uh, his PhD with Sidney Redner. After that, he came to IFIX for three years, uh, working with Maxi mainly. Um, and then he moved again to, to Max Planck Institute in, in Dresden, uh, where he, he was also three years working in, in progress on biological progress. He's interested in statistical, non statistical physics, stochastic processes, and in their applications to social and biological uh, processes. And today he's going to talk us about the effect of temperature on the speed of the Thank you very much, Victor. <coughs> and, uh, well, so first, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, conference in Bama. And, uh, okay, so, um, so I'm happy to be here after after so many years. So I it was already three years, and, and I've been to Palma, so I'm very happy. All right. So uh, I'm going to speak about the, um, the effect of temperature on biological processes. And this is a work I started when I was in, uh, in in Germany in Dresden. So there was a work I did with uh, these people you see here. Um, <coughs> so it's Maria Megase was a PhD student in Dresden, and now she's a postdoc. Um, Abigail Klopper, now she's in London, she was also a postdoc. And Stefan Grill, uh, who was a group leader at the Max Planck Institute, Institute for Complex Systems. So, <coughs> if I'm allowed to, to say something, Abigail Klopper is not just at London, it's an editor of nature physics, so yeah. if you want to... <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. All right. Yeah, I think she started to work uh, like two years ago in London, uh, major physics, but yeah, so now I guess she started. So there's there. some color sometimes having a proper. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so I'm now based in La Plata, Argentina, as Victor um, said. And so I'm coming I'm from Argentina, so I wanted to show you before the talk something related to Argentina. So I. So I basically collected some uh, pictures of the most uh, popular Argentinians nowadays. Okay. Just to start. <laughs> so this is uh, Queen Maxima, <laughs> this is the Queen uh, of the Netherlands, okay. elected this, uh, this uh, year. So of course you have uh, Leo Lionel Messi, right? So all supporters from Barcelona love him, mm -hmm. and also Argentinians, of course. And then you have uh, Paul Francis. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was uh, also elected this year, uh, representative of the Catholic Church. Okay. And uh, of course, you have God Maradona. <laughs> so this is uh, our lover. Okay. Uh, Christina? No, Christina, no, <laughs> Our president is not here, of course. All right. So, uh, so these, these three people, of course, they were popular so many, well, these this two were so popular this, this year, Leo Messi after so many years, and Diego, I think, forever. <laughs> All right, so, um, so as you know, Dios means God in, in, uh, in Spanish, so it's just the number of the, the teacher. All right, so now I'm going back to secular stuff. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. No scientists. No, hmm? no scientists. No scientists, no. <laughs> All right, uh, okay. So first, I'm going to give you an uh, introduction uh, with the motivation of this project. Uh, then I will show you some experimental results that uh, Maria obtained in the lab in Dresden. Um, then I will show you the, the physics side of this uh, project. Okay. So I'm going to present these two models, uh, a simple random walk and also a protein oscillator model. Um, they are useful to study the effects of temperature and the speed of biology. So they are very simple, but you see that they make sense. 
And at the end, I will just uh, state the summary of the OK. So, um, so as you know, temperature is everywhere. Okay? And it's known that it affects all biological processes. Okay? So, so you can think in metabolism of the organisms, ourselves, or animals. Uh, so also development. And so you can think also in the uh, growth of population dynamics. You can think of bacteria and the number of you know the new species that appear in the bacteria, uh, the speed at which they appear depends on temperature. So uh, there were many studies over in the last hundred years okay, on this topic, but it's not clear uh, yet how temperature affects uh, biology in general. Okay. So um, so this topic gained attention uh, during the last two decades because of uh, global warming. So you know temperatures are rising all over the planet. And uh, in 2009, there was a conference in Copenhagen uh, where some people established a, a, or set a limit of two Celsius increase in, in temperatures around the planet. So they, they basically say that temperatures decrease of this limit of two Celsius. Uh, this might cause the extinction of many species. And the reason for this is that uh, species, when they rise the temperature, they change the life cycle. So they are not able to adapt to new temperatures. So they basically will die out. And uh, so actually, the increase in temperature since the 19th century was 0 0.76, 0 0.76 Celsius. And this uh, also caused the extinction of some species. Okay, so these two Celsius would be a lot. And, <coughs> and also, there were. Uh, some studies, uh, empirical studies that relate basically the deviation from exponential law, uh, and now, then I'm going to show you later what it means, it's the Arrhenius law, is related to the limiting uh, temperatures of survival. So basically, when uh, there is a deviation from this law, uh, species don't survive. Okay. So, um, so that's the reason why people have focused uh, in the last, let's say, 20 years. <coughs> in answering this uh, general question. It's basically how do biological rates or the speed of biology vary the temperature. And so this is the, the topic that I'm going to focus on now. All right, so uh, as a starting point is uh, you can take the Arrhenius law, okay? And so it was opposed by uh, uh, Van Hoff in 1885, and then four years after by Savante Arrhenius and it's now, now as a uh, Arrhenius law. So it, it, <coughs> it basically tell, tells you that um, the constant rate of a first order chemical reaction, so it's a chemical reaction, uh, depends on temperature, right? And it's proportional to the uh, ex exponential of the inverse of temperature. And uh, so E here is the activation energy of the chemical reaction, KB is the Boltzmann constant, and A is an amplitude. So it means that if you do uh, an experiment with uh, chemical reactions and you plot, you calculate the constant rate, you plot the log of the constant rate versus the inverse of temperature, you see that the, there are uh, many dots, and the dots fall along a straight line. Okay, you can feel like a perfect straight line. OK. So uh, what is very striking about this uh, law is that actually um, there are many organisms. Mm -hmm. So many organisms follow the law at different uh, time and length scales. Okay. So you can find this law from, let's say, something very microscopic, let's say molecules, all the way to animals. Mm -hmm. So it's very striking because uh, it's very simple, but they, they don't really know how, how it works very well. OK. Uh, so this is a, there was a point of uh, some people in, uh, in the US. They published a very influential paper uh, in 2001 like co-workers and so they basically argue that uh, you know metabolic rates uh, for all metabolic rates or metabolic rates of all organisms follows the Arrhenius law okay and to show this they uh, basically collect data from many species many organisms so let's say from cells to plants uh, all kind of animals amphibians mammals etc and they plot uh, 
the log of the rate versus the inverse, inverse of temperature. And uh, of course, you obtain a cloud of points, you see, here. And they fit this cloud of point by a fine line. Uh, of course, there can be many errors in fitting by the argue that, uh, you know, the dependence on temperature is, is very much this simple exponential. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And also, the other point that they wanted to make is that the slopes, so if you see, are very similar. Okay. So the activation energy of all, you know, these, uh, the processes involved in the metabolism of all these organisms is uh, very similar. It's around uh, six electron volts. So they say that it's, there is some universality about this behavior, okay? And, um, and it's very striking because uh, when you think, for instance, in, a, let's say, uh, the metabolism of a plant, for instance, you have uh, millions of chemical reactions in the system, right? And so each individual reaction obeys the average law, but somehow everything at the macroscopic level is combined to give you an average law at the macro level. Okay. So you get something effective is still average. And the way reactions are combined is not known. So probably it's, uh, you know, they are combined in very complex architectures. So and it's uh, something that we don't know. But it's still the global scale is looks average. Uh, OK. So that was a, the point I want to make. So you, you find this law from very simple uh, molecules, let's say copying scale all the way to animals. All right, so, uh, and then um, what I wanted to do is just to show you uh, another application of the arrangement law to make it more general. <coughs> and uh, so there was a professor in the University of Ottawa, Leider, who collected some plots from different uh, papers where the arrangement law was uh, observed. So this is, for instance, uh, the frequency of chirping of crickets versus the inverse of temperature. So you see that it's uh, perfectly exponential. Uh, this is the, the rate of uh, heartbeat of some uh, aquatic turtles. Okay. So you see there are some deviations at low temperature, but it's still arrhenius. Okay. And so this is the frequency of flashing of fireflies. Okay. So this frequency is also uh, very much arrhenius. And this, in, this experiment, I think, is very interesting. is uh, the frequency of counting. So basically, they do a kind of psychological uh, experiment. So they ask people to count. Okay? And it looks like people count faster when the temperature is high. They, they speed up. Sometimes. And so when they do a different temperatures, they all follow this. this all right. so, uh, so now, motivated by all these results, uh, Maria um, decided to study uh, all these relations very uh, deeply uh, using um, C elegans. Okay. So basically, she studied the cell division, uh, or the speed of cell division as a function of temperature, uh, using cells from uh, this worm that you see here. So C elegans are, uh, this is this uh, animal you observe here. It's one millimeter long, mm, and it's a good uh, um, organism to study because it grows very fast in the lab, right? and it's easy to cultivate. Mm. And also, uh, they have some interesting properties, like, uh, for instance, the, this is the embryo or the cell. It's transparent, so you can clearly see the, the cell in the, in the lab right? using microscope. So you can see all the processes involved in the division just by looking in the microscope. Uh, also, C. elegans are herma, hermaphrodite, so they produce a sperm, and the sperm is um, stored somewhere in the body, and then when they go, they become adult, they fertilize the egg, and the egg is, goes to a basic embryo. Mm -hmm. So this embryo is the, let's say, the first cell, it's the P0 state. Then the cell divides into two cells, and then four cells, and so on. All right, so what uh, Maria did was just uh, trying to identify different uh, events during the first cell division, okay? And these events are very simple, so you can clearly see uh, using the microscope. So the first event is when you 
uh, so we have basically the two, the two nuclei meet right somewhere in the, the shell. Okay. So when they meet, you set the time here, let's say T1. Then the second event is uh, you have the nuclear envelope breakdown. So there's an envelope that breaks, right? And they, they start to exchange chromosomes inside. And then the third event is uh, the squeezing of this, uh, the cortex, okay? So this is the beginning of the cytokinesis. And then the fourth event is basically when the, the cell divides in two. Okay, so the two cells are uh, All right, so now uh, what she basically did is, is uh, to study these different processes at different temperatures and see how the speed of uh, these processes was a function of temperature. Uh, so these are the results here. Okay, and um, okay so you have. Uh, temperature in the x-axis from, let's say, around 10 Celsius to 30 Celsius, and the y-axis uh, this time. Right. So what is important here is that uh, is the difference between two, the time difference between two events. So this is the first event, the green, then you have the second, the third, and fourth. And so you already see that uh, when temperature increases, uh, everything happens faster. Right. So basically the time difference between events is smaller and smaller. Um, so the way you can uh, they define rates is basically calculating the inverse of the time interval between two events. Okay. So for instance, uh, so here they go from nuclear meeting to nuclear breakdown in 55 seconds. So 155 seconds will be the rate associated to this event, to this um, interval. All right, so they obtain a lot of uh, many data and plots and so on, but I just want to show you the most representative uh, results. The idea here is that we, we wanted to use uh, real data or data coming from experiments to try to develop a theory about the uh, temperature and, and speed of biological process. Okay, so this is the, the data I should take, right? Uh, so, there are, so this is the rate versus the inverse of temperature and uh, for four different strains. So this is a strain that came from uh, England, and this is a strain that came from India, and some Pacific strains. So what they did at the beginning was trying to fit this by a straight line. Okay? So you see that there is an interval where uh, the data follows more or less the radius law. Okay? But then there are some deviations, mainly at high temperatures. So it turns out that these uh, deviations are not monotonic. Right? So this is, uh, at least it was very surprising for them because they were supposed to find something faster as the temperature was increasing. But it looks like there is, here as you can see too, that there is a temperature for which everything starts to go uh, slower as you get the temperature. So I think it's going down. So this is slowing down. So they thought there was uh, an error in this uh, Experiments, but then they were kind of happy because they found something similar in the literature. Um, so here there is there's a paper in, published in 2010 where they find something similar. Right? So now this is temperature, and this is uh, the leaf of uh, expansion rates okay? for mice and rice. So you have something that increases the temperature, reaches a maximum, and then increases. And so looking at the literature, you can find something uh, uh, very similar, right? So it looks like there is something universal on this uh, behavior. So, uh, so we asked actually many questions in this project when we started, but I guess uh, it boils down to only three main questions that I, I wrote here. So the first is uh, there is a uh, genetic law or how rates depend on, um, on temperature for all biological processes. So the second is if you can formulate this as a mathematical expression, and the, sec the third one is uh, can, how can you explain this? Mm -hmm. uh, this simple expression. So to, um, to keep it simple, what I did is uh, I basically wrote the, uh, right now the, the results that you take. And then I will try to explain the, this the result. So as you, as a physicist, you expect something simple, 
So this is what you obtain, very simple. So we, we found that this equation fits uh, the data very well. Okay. So not only the cell division data, but also uh, many other data found, found in the literature. So it's composed by uh, basically the inverse of two arranged terms. Mm -hmm. okay. And just to show you how this equation works, uh, so here you have a plot, right? So what happens is when, uh, uh, say, beta is very large, okay, so you have a low, low temperatures, this term dominates, okay, and you have a pure exponential decay. And this is because the energy E1 is larger than E2. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, when beta is very small, so you are here, high temperatures, uh, this other term becomes important. So you have something that it has slope uh, minus E2. So if E2 becomes negative, then you have some non-monotonic behavior. So if you think about physics terms, you can think that this is the first order uh, or zero order formula, the Arrhenius, and then this is the perturbation to first order. So as long as you add this term, then you can reproduce all the deviations or most deviations you find. Okay. Uh, so this is how now it fits the real data. Uh, so these these dots are um, experimental results, right? For each experiment, and then circles are the average values. And the solid line is basically the fitting using this equation. So then we have another one, this is another integral, <coughs> and this is another integral. Okay, um, so at least people in the lab were very interested in uh, using equations to fit data because then they can say something about biology in general. So, uh, I'm not going to speak uh, more about this stuff because it's pure biology, but just going to tell you a few things. I think they're the most important ones. Uh, that basically, they want to compare different strains okay. and how they adapt a new tem uh, to new temperatures. So the blue dots are, so basically, there were two strains. Uh, they were the, the, the same one, right, 50 years ago. Uh, I think they were in the same place in England, and then one was taken to India, so where the, the temperature is much higher. And it looks like they change, right? the way they, uh, they evolve, or they, they, the processes evolve over time. Okay. So, so the blue uh, dots are the strain from England, right? so it's cold weather, and the red dots are the strain from, uh, the strain from India, so it's hot weather. So what happens is that the, the cell division takes longer in uh, the strain from India. And because it takes longer, it can lead to uh, higher temperatures. So you see that here uh, there is a limitation of, uh, so you, can, you cannot go higher in temperature because the cell division doesn't happen for the blue, but it does for the red. So they argue that, uh, or the people in our lab argue that um, Basically, strains can adapt to uh, higher temperatures by slowing down the, the cell cycle. So you can actually, uh, by fitting the formula, you can obtain this shift in temperatures uh, very precisely. These are the T star that you see here. And the shift is, is around 2 Celsius. So to confirm this, you can actually shift this data, uh, the red dots, to the left and two Celsius, and you see that the data falls on top of each other. So it looks like now we have two different strains living in different places in the world, but they have the same uh, very similar temperature dependence. Uh, okay, so now um, we're going to go to the more of the physics side of the, the project, where we're trying to uh, understand basically this um, two exponential expression that we obtain. Right? That is supposed to be, yeah. Fede, uh, so you are saying that this, uh, at least the, the experiments with the, with the, st with the strong non monotonic behavior, you are able to fit with two exponentials if one of the exponentials has, an, has a negative activation energy, right? Yeah. Do you think you know, that, that before you enter in the physical part that maybe you have some interpretation, do, do the biologists have 
some interpretation for this because in, in, in standard yes. for chemistry, I mean, people can use these uh, transition state theories or you have an activated complex and, and this is the activation energy is the difference between the reactants and so on. So having a negative. Right, See, yeah, negative that's, that's what I wanted to, to, to say. Yeah, to say right now, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, negative energy is at no physical meaning, but you can actually obtain something similar using positive, or something non monotonic using positive energies. Exactly the. So, uh, right, so the point I think you wanted to make is uh, that we actually <coughs> try different models, right? Uh, we started with something that was, I think, a complex network, and then we use a one dimensional chain until it boils down to a very single graph. So these are three states, A, B, and C, and this is these are microscopic states states of a biological system. So, for instance, for the cell, this will be the beginning, the pre-nuclear meeting, and this is the, the final will be the cytogenesis or division of the cell. Um, so the thing is, the system goes, let's say, from uh, state A to B with a rate K one, and then from B to C with a rate K two. Right. So. Assuming that these two rates are arrhenius, okay, so then you obtain that the total time to go from A to C is also the sum of two exponentials. So of course, if, as you were saying, if you have something non-monotonic, then E2 uh, has to be negative, and there is a problem. So again, we were physicists, so we're trying to uh, do something very simple. So what we did is we had uh, basically a backward rate. Right? So we have the same, the same graph, but now with the possibility of going uh, backwards. So we have four rates um, for A to B and B to C with rate K, A, and backward rate with the rate, uh, backward steps with the rate KB. So now these energies are positive, okay? This EA and EB are as much as zero, they have physical meaning. And so you can work out the, the first passage uh, times from A to C, that's the total time, the mean time, and write in the recorded formula. And what you obtain is basically the sum of two exponential terms um, that the one we had before. So the only things you have to do is identify EA with uh, energy E1 and all two EA minus EB with energy uh, E2. And you get this, this uh, simple uh, problem. Um, OK. Just to. I want to show you the, the way it works or why this is uh, non monotonous. Uh, so, in this regime, you have only direct trajectories. So, Ka is much larger than Kb. So, we walk the random walk, say, jumps from A to B and then from B to C directly. So, we have direct trajectories in this way, and then uh, this is a pure exponential increase. But then, uh, when Kb becomes similar to Ka, there are jumps that goes backward like this. Okay? And the random walk stay a little bit longer. But then when KB is much larger than KA, then it, it goes, so it goes from A to B and then it made from B to A. So it gets trapped in this loop many, many times until it leaves. So there is a competition of two mechanisms here. So when beta <coughs> temperature increases, you go like this, so beta increases. So the walker uh, works faster. Right? So it moves faster along the, this graph, but it goes backward more, more often. Right? So these, these two terms compensate. Right? So it gets trapped in this loop and until it leaves, so this gives you something that it takes longer. All right. So, um, so now uh, that was kind of the, the, the first half of the project. And of course, it's a uh, very, very simple toy model. and. The idea was trying to see if there is something related to connection to biology. Right. And um, so at the beginning, we thought that maybe uh, if you zoom enough in, uh, in the biological system, the dynamics can be mapped to this three node configuration. Okay. And, but we needed some uh, connection to, to biology. So that's uh, the reason why we started to work with uh, protein networks. Okay. Um, <coughs> so we're working with the cell division. So uh, you know that there are uh, networks that regulate the cell cycle. Okay. 
And for, for C elegance, these networks are not known. Okay? But for who it is, it's very well studied. So we have this uh, sort of uh, configuration. So uh, here, the nodes are the proteins. So biologists know exactly the function of each protein and how they affect to each other. So green arrows means that, for instance, this protein is activating this, and the red arrow means that uh, inhibition. Okay. Um, so again, this network was very complicated, so we, we realized that there was something much simpler. So if you look at the, let's say, for instance, these three nodes or proteins, uh, you find something that's very simple. It looks like this. Uh, this kind of configuration is uh, repeated in many parts of the network. Uh, you can see almost everywhere. Uh, simple topology. And then we realized, looking at literature, that uh, this configuration of, let's say, a positive feedback loop between two proteins and a negative feedback loop connected uh, is, uh, is very common in nature. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is that uh, oscillate, this is an oscillator <coughs> mode, okay? and the oscillations are robust. Okay? So people have um, seen that uh, if you change the frequency of um, oscillations, then the amplitude remains constant. Okay? So this is uh, somehow uh, an oscillator that is, is common to find in, in many things in nature. Okay, so um, so the way it works is so you have uh, basically a concentration, okay, so of protein I, so from zero to one, it's a real number, and then when this uh, protein, let's say, concentration is above a certain threshold, so the protein is expressed, and uh, the, the you can say the protein is active. If the concentration is below a uh, given threshold then the protein is inactive. So we have only two states, on and off, uh, one and zero. It's, very, uh, it's like a spinning system. So for instance, if you activate this protein, then this protein activates protein two, and two activates three. But then three represents two, and then two switch off one. So you have kind of cycle in the activity of the system. So we start to oscillate, right? until it's, uh, all proteins are inactive and the system stops. Okay. Um, so we want to basically study how uh, temperature affects the time to go to this fixed point. The fixed point is where all proteins are inactive. And so I think this model is very long, so I'm not going to give you the Sorry, uh, yeah. why minus two? Yeah, so, ah, OK. Is it a quantitative? Yeah, so the thing is, uh, yeah, you have to uh, change the, the strength of the interaction to make oscillations uh, to be in the way we want to be, basically. Um, so the thing is, if this uh, strength is not, is not larger than this one, I think it will be, let's say, 2 and minus 4 or 3 and minus 6. So this strength should be larger than the activation. Um, so the reason is that otherwise I think the system never uh, it stays in a oscillating all, all the time and never reaches the final fixed point. Uh, okay. And also the, the the law you write for the activity is just the the use of simplification. I mean the of a sigmoidal. I mean just the, yeah. the so I mean the the heavy um, side that it's zero below one half. Yes. Yeah. I mean normally in, in realistic terms I mean, that's or right. Yeah. Some hill function, all that. Yeah, this is actually. Uh, uh, I think we 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 obtain this model from a Boolean network model. Yeah. So Booleans are basically binary variables, and yes. and the people argue that argue that uh, if you instead of using this uh, zero and one, you use something continuous, you get something similar. So there is not much different. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is the, the evolution of the system. It's a stochastic equation, and um, so you have a noise term, and then a self-degradation term of uh, the concentration of proteins. And this is um, basically the, um, the interaction with other proteins. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, the model I think is very long to explain all the details here, but I just want to mention the basically the, the easiest part of the, the results. So this is the evolution of the system in the in the space of of states of the total network, the total oscillator. For instance, A prime is the state in which uh, protein one is active, zero is inactive, and sorry, protein one is active, and two and three are inactive. And then arrow down mean down means uh, that the concentration is decaying, right? And up is rising. So because there is uh, noise in the system, okay, this uh, noise over here, the system is not deterministic. Okay, so you can either jump to this state or this other one, depending on what happens in the protein. So for instance, from here to here, protein 2 becomes active. And from here to here, protein 1 becomes inactive. So then you can jump here and then all along the network. And what happens is that, uh, for instance, you can go from this state here, here, to there, and then go back to the same point. So you have these loops that basically we were looking for in the in this three node configuration we I mentioned before. So um, to keep it simple, we we try to summarize this uh, or map this to a simple graph, uh, just using the, the the main nodes in the network, and this is the result. So here you can clearly see that there are trajectories that basically get trapped in this loop, and then they exit to C. And this uh, this graph is uh, topologically equivalent to the three-node configuration we were uh, mentioning at the beginning. So actually, we started from something simple. So we thought that maybe biology contains this. It's not exactly this, but it's something similar, at least for the oscillator that we obtain. Um, of course, if you work with the entire uh, node 3 proteins, or you, you work with the entire network of proteins, um, so this network here, um, so the evolution which may, will be much more complicated than this. You have uh, basically 2 to the power 11, because there are 11 proteins, different states. So this is 1,024 uh, different states. right? And it's much more complicated, but we we haven't done the simulation, and we think that maybe the evolution is something similar uh, to the evolution in a single oscillator. Okay. Um, and just to, to summarize what I explained in, in conclusions. Um, oh, so before, okay. So these are the results of the um, yeah, so the medical results using the these. Um, the protein network, okay? So uh, this is the mean fixation time. Uh, so these are the circles here. And the solid line as is the fit using two exponentials. Uh, of course, if you want to obtain something analytical for this uh, system, it's very hard, but uh, it can be approximated by uh, two exponentials. And also, um, Yes, and also this is the inverse of the, the time, which is the right. So you see already that this is very similar to what we found in experiments. And so. All right, so now I give you the conclusions. So I, I think I convinced you that there are many things in nature that look arrhenius, okay? So basically, uh, at all la the time and length scales. Mm -hmm. um, you can obtain uh, basically a simple formula uh, that fits the data very well using a uh, three node configuration, this ABC. And uh, this configuration contains two exponential terms that fits the data very well. And this, uh, <coughs> these two exponentials probably are the combination of many other exponentials there in the system. Right? And you can maybe reduce this to only two, the most representative. And uh, the way you can actually explain or have a connection to biology is just by using this uh, oscillator model. And uh, yes, so basically obtain something, uh, evolution the system that it looks very similar to the three node configuration. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's the way to explain connection to biology and physics. Okay, so I think that's, yeah, that's all for the talk.
the ones we think from the So you mean this, this one? Yeah, yeah, no, this one is uh, for the, um, yeah, for the theoretical model, okay? Uh, so probably has nothing to do with the, the, the real, you know, biology real. But I think the comparison could be, uh, so this is, I think this number doesn't really matter because they are just, I think we use any, any input in the system, so we give you some. So the comparison should be done in the, in the, when we feed the data, right. so at the beginning, uh, yes, so, yes, yeah, so at the beginning we obtain some uh, yeah, energy, so values from the fitting that it yeah, looks very similar to yeah, the one they obtained from experiments. Uh, by for instance, um, yeah, this number here, right? Um, yes. So these are basically the ones. So the idea here is that you you start with the data and then you try to fit with a simple Arrhenius, right? So it gives you some numbers and energies. You compare these energies to the ones obtained in the, the entire experiment, and they look similar. similar. And then, of course, you kind of do a, another analysis using an extra exponential and you get some corrections. And this, then you compare these energies that you take here to the ones that they are published in the literature and they are very similar. So somehow, this is fitting not the, so this, okay, so this is fitting the formula to the, to the, to the experiment, okay? Not fitting the model, so fitting the formula. The model is used to obtain the formula, but uh, not exactly from the model to the same. There is something in between. I think here you use, uh, is in the, the units are in electron, in basically joules or kilojoules, and the one you find the, uh, yeah, in these experiments I showed you in the beginning, um, So, uh, so actually, the, this is the, the experiment done with many organisms, and it looks like the one, the number we obtain are very similar to this, to this number. Okay. But again, this is using it's very tricky because we op, we use the formula to feed the data, and obtain values that they are reasonable, but we don't have the model to obtain exactly the, the same numbers because the model I, I think is too theoretical thing. It gives you the, let's say, the mathematical shape, but it doesn't give you the real, the quantity values. Yeah. When deriving the the array is lower, the, the, the usual so approach is that you have a, some system that deterministically will stay on the some potential well and will only jump uh, if there is enough noise to make the jump. And then you drive this exponential dependence on the intensity of the noise, which is the what is called temperature. But do you think that when a cell divides, it's because there is some strong noise event that makes it to divide? It's yeah, okay. Uh, uh, this is uh, very reasonable for me. Okay. Um, yes, okay. I know this kind of question that's been so many times, and yeah. <laughs> I think I changed the talk many, many, many ways and many times that uh, to avoid this kind of question, but it still comes <laughs> on over and over. Uh, yeah, the thing is, uh, yeah, if you think in, in, the, in the real cell division, right? Uh, yes, it's hard to think in all these processes that are happening in the model, right? This transition you mentioned from uh, basically a transition over uh, our real, okay? But, uh, we still think that, so the way I think we did, so we came up with this three node configuration and we trying to say, well, how can we find this in nature? Okay. And the way to maybe to explain this, let me show you the, again. 
I think I told you in the, the beginning of the talk that this one will be one state of cell, be maybe the second state, and so on. Right? But this is not very possible. So what we think is that maybe, okay, if you zoom in the system, so if you go all the way to chemical reactions, transitions are uh, arranged because this is well established in 150 years ago in one single chemical reaction. Now, if you zoom out the system, maybe there is some scale where something changes. So we stop there, and and then take this as a uh, let's say limiting microscopic scale. Right. So this is basically a it's microscopic. Lowest, chemical reaction Sorry. It's lowest chemical reaction for example. No. Well, the, yeah. No. This is another theory. This is the the limiting reaction theory. So the the way they explain the uh, Arrhenius law is they say, well, there are one million chemical reactions. But there is one that is the slowest one. And because this is uh, a renus, so everything has to be a renus. Right. But of course, it's much more complicated than this. And this, a single reaction won't explain the, the non-monotonic behavior. So you need at least something else. And also, when you sum many uh, exponentials, okay, you don't get the, the time is the slowest one. You get a combination of many. Less. Okay. So it's not the, this, this, I think, theory is not uh, very valid because doesn't fit the data well, and also it's hard to think that it's only one reaction that's limited in everything. Uh, so we think is that maybe this kind of motif is somewhere in the microscopic system, right, at some scale, and then, because maybe the system is composed by many of these things combined, like I show you in the, in the, in the network proteins, right, so you, you can look at different scales and you find the same pattern. We actually still working with the entire network because when I so you get the protein network, the state space is very complicated. So maybe uh, if you look at some uh, part of the network, right, the evolution is uh, looks like this three node, and then you have a combination of many things that repeat uh, at, at every scale. So maybe there is some uh, auto uh, self all these self organization. Fractal geometry. Yeah. That, I mean, this is something that I think we started with the simplest thing and we, we can't prove this. Yeah. I think it's very. Many other things in another process. So the proof is that you, if you look at the data, many data look like the non-monotonic. I show you for subdivision. 
There are also works in, in ecology that uh, they have for population of in the growing of bacteria. They show the same, they call it the hump uh, shape. Right? So everything can fit it by the same format. So, um, yeah, so we don't know exactly, I, even for simple systems like the cell, all the processes are a kind of black box. We don't know what's going inside. But we speculate that maybe something like this is happening right? in very different, different systems. I think also um, by mistake people have used by chance two exponentials to fit some data, but they yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah the, the, the thing is that there are no experiments that they confirm these uh, looping trajectories we said. The system goes to one state and then goes back to the same state. That would be very nice to perform an experiment when you can see this. Yeah. For now it's in the theory. Uh, okay, I think you have a note for the east cell, uh, sorry, for the east cell uh, protein network, I have for something simpler, yes, all the energies. But I think for protein folding, you have all the values and things like that. Yes. My but interesting to incorporate, see what is the randomization of each Yes. Similar. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. I think that we are in that direction because uh, something I, I haven't shown you is that suppose that you work with a simple network, and you are able to take the analytical expression for this. It's horrible. So it's a sum of uh, thousand exponentials. But then what you do is you can renormalize the system, okay, and then reduce it to less and less exponentials, and then you get only two. So it looks like if you renormalize the system, you get a coarsening picture that looks at the coarsening level uh, similar to the one I was showing, at least mathematically. So maybe if you do the coarsening now in the face, you get uh, um, yes, you get some part of the system where the system gets trapped and then it dips to another state and so on. Like this. Thank you. Thank you.